Can somebody indicate that they can hear me and see me? Excuse me, hear me and see the uh, screen. Screen yes, has yes. week four on it. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is week four, as you can imagine. I just want to go over this with you. This His is your place. Asleep. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, sorry. That's all right. Uh, if, if you were on earlier, you probably heard me talking to my wife. Somebody called about our Discover card. We don't have a Discover card, so that's okay. Uh, this is your place to find out what's coming up and what's due. Uh, sometimes people will email me and say, well, it wasn't on Canvas assignments. Well, Pearson is not hooked into Canvas, okay? So your Pearson assignments won't appear as an assignment on Canvas. And so rather than I'm waiting for somebody to do that later on, I am cluing you in that this is the way things are gonna look uh, from now on, oh, you know, they just, I've evolved this uh, from what it was last semester to this semester. You can see what the lecture is for this week and you can see what your assignments are for this week. You can then look down and start seeing assignments due. So your assignments due for February the 8th, which is next Monday, are chapter 17. Remember I delayed chapter 17 because we were having such a problem with Adobe Flash Player because it was no longer uh, being supported. And so the, I put this assignment up on Pearson and people have been able to do it. And so that's good. And so that's due uh, next Monday. And also your Pearson assignments for chapter 18 are due next Monday, that's February the 8th. The following week, we have a holiday on Monday. So that's why these assignments are due on Tuesday. That will be the Pearson assignments for today, okay, which is only a chapter test and the blood vessel lab module, which are two modules on Pearson, okay? They're on Pearson, they're just like chapter 17. You go in and do them on Pearson, they get automatically, once you uh, click save, they get automatically uploaded. You don't have to do save them PDA files, you don't have to do any of that. The other thing I'll remind you is that exam one, chapter 17, 18, and 19 is going to open next Monday, February the 6th. We will have at the start of next class for the first 30 minutes, a review, okay? A review for chapter 17, 18 and 19 because chapter 20, the chapter we're gonna talk about is not very extensive, it's on the lymphatic system. Okay, it will close, usually it close in one week. So usually it will close the following Monday, but Monday being a holiday, it's gonna close on Tuesday. And we will talk more about the exam when we have the review next week. But remember, Next week at the first part of class from 1 to 1.30, or maybe a little bit longer, we're gonna have a review the things I think is important for the exam, okay? So just remember that. Let's go look at the next documents. Down here, uh, chapter 19, blood vessels, rather than being the old traditional thing that you used to see, it is now this thing. It tells you what to do to log into Pearson. There's two assignments to complete, okay? Chapter 19, but activity one and activity three, uh, each of them's worth 15 points. You have till Tuesday, February the 16th to complete them, okay? So you have uh, two weeks in the day. There's a 2%, just like on the Pearson homework assignments, there's a 2% deduction a day up to a maximum of 20%. And I gave an example so that you would understand that. If it is, if the uh, thing, here's an example. If the thing is worth 100 points, there's a 2% deduction a day. So at day one, there'd be two points. Day two, there'd be four points. Day uh, three, there'd be six points. And at the end of 10 days, there would be a 20 point deduction. So that would be 80 out of 100 if you did everything right. The reason being is I, I made a mistake of allowing people to turn in the assignments whenever they wanted to. And most, uh, not most people, but I had about five, six, seven, eight people who didn't do any assignments to the end of the semester. Well, that doesn't give you any benefit, okay? You don't learn the process, okay? So, after 10 days, yeah, you can do it. You can wait till the end of the semester because the maximum deduction is going to be 
So if you wait 10 days, you're going to have 20%. If you wait 20 days, it's still going to be 20%. If you wait to the last day of the semester, which I believe is the 4th or the 5th of May, there'll still be a 20% deduction. So you still have that ability to wait, except you're not going to get full credit for it. So that's, I just want to make that as a point, and that's on your homework, and that is on your lab modules, which are, which are here. Uh, and also the few that we have to turn in, I see some people have been able to do the interactive physiology and have already turned that in. That's good. And turned in the heart module, so that's good. Now that doesn't apply to exams. Exams are due on a day and a time. And they are due that day and that time and they'll automatically submit if you don't submit it. Okay, and we'll discuss that later. So that doesn't pertain to exams, okay? That only pertains to our lab modules, okay? Whether they be on Pearson or whether they be separate units or our Pearson homework assignments, okay? So that's what that pertains to. Uh, just to show you here, this is assignments. This is where I put the assignments up, okay? For, for your Pearson assignments, for your homework assignments, there's only one assignment this time. There's only a chapter test, okay? So that's all the Pearson assignments that you have for chapter 19. The lab assignments are these two assignments here, okay? You'll just click on them. And when you click on them, you, I get the student view. And you have this assignment here. You click on it. And you run through the questions and run and do the experiment, okay? And you, you have pre-lab tests and everything like that, just like you were doing if you were doing it through Physio X, but doing Physio X 10.2. Actually, this is Physio X 10.2 here. The last recorded lecture. How could you not find the last recorded lecture? All right. Here was chapter 18, okay? Here's the recorded lecture probably from the summer or the fall. Here's the recorded lecture that we did last week. Now it has no editing to it, okay? So you click on it and, you know, I probably was logged in 15 or 20 minutes early. So you have to move this thing down here a little bit. But it does work. I don't know why we don't have any sound here. Oh, we don't have any sound because I have my microphone on here. That's why we don't have any sound. But it does work. The same. And so this is the recorded lecture. So from last week, you actually have two lectures. You have the lecture from the right here in the module. You have the lecture from uh, who knows, it's probably it was either the summer or the fall. Okay. And you have the lecture that I did last spring. Now, this one would have been, would have been edited, which means I would have trimmed the front and the back off of it. But in order to get this up the same day that we had it, I just, once it got downloaded, I put it in, into YouTube and once they manu once they did whatever they did to it, then I put it up here, okay? So the lectures are right there. So when you say you can't find them, I don't understand that question. Uh -uh. I, I, I hope that answers your question anyway. I don't know why you were looking for it in Zoom, but that's okay. Yeah. I, I, I still have that first uh, chapter 17 lecture that stuck in Zoom because I thought I was going to be able to put them all in Zoom, but it turns out I didn't have enough storage. So that is that. I think I've covered everything uh, that I needed to cover as far as announcement wise go. If you just got here next week from about 1 to 1 30, we're going to do a review of chapter 17, 18, and 19. Okay. For the exam, where will the exam be when you get ready to take it? It'll be under assignments. It'll be exam one. Now, obviously, you don't have it yet because it's not published or it shouldn't be published. Oh, it's, it, it might be published 
but the fact that the due date's already gone by is uh, you don't have access to it. And these exams close, and uh, uh, we'll talk about that next week. I don't mean to get too confusing on stuff, but I just wanted to uh, uh, introduce that, tell you that we're going to have a review next week. We're going to talk about the two things that I said we're going to talk about this week. We're going to go ahead and talk about next week, RH and peripheral blastus vitalis. We're going, to, we're going to talk about the things that I think are important in the three chapters, and also I'll point you in the direction of, uh, of uh, what might be on the questions, okay? As long as we keep a good attendance, I will keep recording these lectures because this is a face-to-face -face lecture and you're responsible for being here. I'm not required to record the lectures, okay? I'm not required anymore to record the lectures because you're responsible for being here because this is a face-to-face -face meeting class, just like if you were in a lecture in the school, okay? Which reminds me, they've already put up the um, schedule for the summer. And I'm teaching two classes, uh, a, a 2085C and 2086C. The 85C is Monday, Wednesday, 8 to 1020. And the 86C is Monday, Wednesday, 1 to 320. So if you got anybody who wants to take the class, just whenever registration starts, it's available. And I'll, I'll, I'll keep announcing that. We're going to talk a little bit about blood vessels. We may not get through everything. If not, I will finish up a lecture on it, plus you already have a recorded thing. The blood vessels, we've talked about the medium, the blood. We've talked about the pump that moves uh, the blood throughout this, these channels. And now we're talking about the channels of the road, you know, the roads. You can think about the, uh, the uh, roads, you know, the, the east and west bound lanes, north and south bound lanes, everything about interstate. There's five major types of blood vessels. They are arteries which carry blood away from the heart, okay? Not always oxygenated blood, okay? Remember, the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary artery out of the heart carry deoxygenated blood because the blood's returned to the heart. We have arterioles, okay, which are the arteries which are branching into the smaller branches. We have capillaries, which are one cell layer thick, okay? One cell layer thick blood vessels where the exchange occurs. This is where nutrients, nutrient exchange occurs, waste product exchange occurs, O2 exchange occurs, and CO2 exchange occurs. So we have, art, we have a heart here, we have arteries, we have arterioles, we have capillaries here. Okay, this is the capillary bed. This is, no exchange really occurs here or no exchange occurs here, okay? This is where all the action is, okay? This is where all the action is. So you're going down a big interstate, big interstate highway. You get off, a, you get off the, uh, you know, off the uh, exit, and then eventually you get down to the road into the subdivision, where you know where the uh, where if you're the uh, DoorDash driver, where you're going to drop off the food or whatever you're dropping off, uh, and that's where all the exchange occurs. It doesn't. You're not doing exchange on interstate, or you're not doing exchange at the exit. You're not doing exchanges on the on the uh, surface highways, but you're only doing it when you get down to the level of the, the, the least unit. In other words, one cell layer thick, okay? And then we have venules, so, arter so heart arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and then guess what, we have veins, okay? Veins are gonna carry blood back to the heart. Arteries, three layers, as you can imagine, there's an intima, okay? Tunica just means coat. Uh, covering, okay, innermost layer. So we have the innermost layer of the blood vessels in contact with the blood lined with squiffles, simple squamous epithelium, continuous with the endocardial layer of the heart. Ideally, we'd want that to be one smooth layer from the time it leaves in the heart till it comes all the way back, okay? We don't want any turbulence, uh, you know, that's caused by any bumps. We don't want any plaques. We don't want any narrowing. We don't want any thickening. We just like to have one continuous layer. The media is the circularly arranged smooth muscle. Okay, so we have smooth muscle that's circularly arranged. I can contract or dilate, vasoconstrictor, vasodilate. And then we have the tunica externa, which is the outside layer. Collagen fibers reinforce blood vessels. We have nerve fibers that are, uh, surround the blood vessels. 
And if it's a really big blood vessel, we have its own little blood supply in the tunica externa because it's going to need blood supplied to it. And because it's a larger vessel, these layers are thicker. So we're going to have to have a blood supply to those thickened layers. Okay. Types of arteries. We have elastic arteries, which are conducting arteries. Remember when that pulse comes out of the heart, it's a pulse. It's a pulse pressure of blood. Okay. The ventricles contract, contract, contract. When they overcome the pressure outside the, the uh, aortic and pulmonic valves, a pulse of blood comes out, okay? If that was a rigid vessel, okay, if that was a rigid vessel, it would not be able to contain the pulse, okay? Uh, or the pulse, the, that huge pressure pulse would be transmitted further, okay? And so we have a elastic or conducting arteries, which are the aorta, the common carotids, of clavian vertebrals, and pulmonary, you're not going to have any pictures where you have to identify blood vessels. The, the identification is what I've already told you about the chambers of the heart and the vessels coming off the heart and vessels coming back to the heart. You're not going to have a picture where you're going to have to identify the vertebral artery or the internal iliac artery. Okay. But these, get, these, when that pulse pressure hits them, they go out. And then once the pressure is gone, they contract back. Okay. Are they? They retract back, not contract, but retract back. They're the largest arteries that are nearest the heart. Highest pressure, fastest blood flow, smooth blood flow. Okay. So arteries, as you can imagine, largest, largest arteries nearest to the heart, highest pressure because the pressure is going to diminish as we get away from the heart. Pressure is going to diminish as we get away from the heart. And we can see this. This is a systolic pressure, this is a diastolic pressure. Heart at rest, heart during uh, pumping the blood. These are the pressures here. As we get away, that narrows until we literally just have one pressure. We have muscular arteries, okay, which are distributing arteries. Those are our exits, okay. Those are our exits. They are going. They are going to take us. They're either going to take us to Mandarin. They're going to take us to St. Augustine. They're going to take us downtown. They're going to take us to the west side. They are the distributing vessels, okay? Are they gonna go up to the head? Are they gonna go down to the arms? Are they gonna go down to the lower extremities? You can see that they're smaller in diameter. Moderate size, distribute blood to specific organs. Pressure and velocity are decreasing. They're less elastic, more smooth muscle because they're distributing. If we don't need so much blood going to the muscles, we're at rest. You know, the ones that are distributing blood to the muscles, might contract, okay, and send more of that blood to the GI system. They're more active than the vasoconstriction and vasodilatation. And then we have the meta arterioles, okay. These are meta arterioles. They are the smallest arteries in the arterial system. They determine whether or not blood flow is going to go through that particular capillary bed. If we're in our fight or flight reflex, our sympathetic reflex, We've already decided that we don't need to do digestion during that time. We just need to take care of whatever the stress is, whether it be running away from the T-Rex, okay? If you had my class last semester, you know, when we talked about the autonomic nervous system, we talked about the T-Rex, you know, chasing you and what, you, what systems you need to do. So that meta arterio would constrict and then not allow blood flow to go into that capillary bed for the purpose of digestion. Obviously, it would still get blood to the intestine because the intestine's got to stay alive, but we don't need that capillary bed that's going to absorb the nutrients. And they regulate blood flow into the capillaries using the precapillary sphincters. So this is an example where the capillary bed is open. Okay. These are our meta arterioles here. These are our meta arterioles here closed. Okay. So rather than perfuse the capillary bed, Say that we'll just say this is capillary bed for digestion. The blood flow is just right straight through. It's just right straight through. Pressure and velocity flow are still decreasing. As you can imagine, they're still decreasing as we go out. Muscular arteries, elastic arteries, uh, our, uh, uh, arter uh, arterioles, meta arterioles, capillary bed, all decreasing. Capillaries distribute oxygenated blood to all cells. Capillaries distribute oxygenated blood to all cells. Every cell in our body needs oxygen, 
Okay. Smallest fed vessels with the thinnest walls, one millimeter. Their average length is one millimeter. Okay. And their average thickness is one cell layer thick. Here's every cell in the body, but number depends on the tissues they serve. Obviously, the tissues that require a great deal of oxygen, like the brain and the heart, okay, would require extensive capillary beds, okay, and tissues that don't require as much oxygen, okay, would not have as extensive capillary beds. Low pressure, slow velocity of flow, that, you know, it, mechanically it makes sense because low pressure, slow velocity of flow, because this is where the exchange occurs, okay? This is where exchange for oxygen and CO2. Oxygen goes into the set, in, goes out of the capillary into the interstitial fluid, okay? Interstitial fluid. That's that fluid but that's outside of the cell, okay? And it has two components. Uh, uh, excuse me, it's extracellular fluid. It's this fluid outside the cell. The extracellular fluid has two components. The part that's in the vascular system either in the, in the vessels that we're talking about or the lymphatic system or the part that's outside of those vascular systems and not in the cells. So remember the cells are bathed by fluid. So that exchange goes out of the capillary through that interstitial fluid. But remember the capillary bed is literally surrounding the cell. Okay, exchange material between blood and interstitial fluid. Walls of the capillaries are a basement membrane with a single layer of endothelial cells. Exchange of materials between cells and the capillaries. Nutrients, gases, and other small molecules across, the, across by diffusion. Fluid also crosses the vessel walls and is forced out by hydrostatic pressure. We're going to talk about this pressure in a little bit. If we don't get to it today, we'll talk about it definitely on uh, your review next week because this is one of your discussion questions about how does fluid exchange occur, okay? Interstitial hydrostatic pressure and chlorosmotic pressure Oppose hydrostatic pressure. Okay, hydrostatic pressure is the pressure inside of the blood vessel trying to push the fluid out. Okay, remember we're one cell layer thick. These cells are, you know, they got leaky membranes. Okay, so they're so they're able to push the fluid at back. The interstitial fluid has a pressure too. Okay, that's the interstitial hydrostatic pressure, and so it's pushing back. So you might have twenty pushing out and five pushing back, so you'd have a net out of 15 if you were me measuring in millimeters of mercury. I'm just trying to give you sort of an introduction here. So hydrostatic pressure uh, inside the vessel is the pressure inside the vessel has a tendency to try to push the fluid out. The interstitial hydrostatic pressure, that fluid outside of the blood vessel has a pressure too, okay? You can put, a, you can put an electrode in and measure it, and they do. And say, let's say, like I say, Again, it's five millimeters of mercury. The hydrostatic pressure inside the vessel is 20. So 20 minus five is a total of 15 and the 15 is going outwards. And then finally, we have a colloidal osmotic pressure. Inside the blood vessels, there are still things that don't get pushed out. So a lot of things get pushed out with the fluid, but we have big cells, red cells and white cells, and we have big molecules that don't get pushed out. Well, they're surrounded by fluid, primarily water, okay? And so they have a tendency to try to keep that water close to them. So you have a you have a pressure inside that's trying to push fluid out. You have a pressure outside that's trying to push fluid in, and you have a pressure inside that's trying to hold that fluid inside because it's surrounding the molecules. So those are the three actors in this situation. Out the capillaries, we have continuous or nanometer clefts. So we have clefts in the capillaries. Penetrated 20 to 100 nanometer holes. How big are nanometers? Okay. Anybody remember? A micron is 10 to the minus 6. Okay. So a nanometer is 10 to the minus 9. Okay. And a picometer is 10 to the minus 12. You will be working with nanometers, well, nanometer technology and nanometer drug delivery systems at some point in your career if you're going into the medical field. They're already starting to do that, and it would be good for diagnosis too. Be good for diagnosis, be good for delivery, specific delivery, so you can target where you want your medications to go. We have sinusoids, which are just blood-filled spaces. They have incomplete basement membranes. We have some in the brain, and we have some at the placenta, uh, uterine interaction, uh, 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 
surface uh, join service, and we'll talk about that later on in one, another one of the chapters. We have venules. Okay, the venules join the capillaries. This is the capillary bed. Thin wall, but relatively impermeable, except the smallest ones, which are extremely permeable. So when you get from capillary, you know, these are not really distinct, uh, you know, uh, uh, changes, okay? So the small venules are literally a little bit bigger than the, than the capillary, so they're still ex extremely porous. But once you get into the venous system, it's just like the arterial system. It's a highway, okay? It's a highway. And so you're going to keep going on that highway till you get back to the heart. Pressure still falling, so all the pressure continues to fall, okay? Veins, joining of venules, same layer as the arteries, they're just not as thick, okay? They're conducting vessels. Larger lumens, but thinner walls uh, versus the arteries. Blood reservoirs only, partially filled. Lowest pressure in the circuit. So the veins have the lowest pressure on the circuit. So if you had a question, whether it be a matching, uh, a multiple choice, true, false, the lowest pressure in the circuit is in the veins. Okay, they also, because the pressure is so low, and because it's so low, uh, if we're able to get the fluid up to that portion of the vein, we want to have a one-way valve so it doesn't fall, you know, go back downwards, okay? Because we depend on the on breathing in the thorax and we depend on muscle contraction in our muscles to move that blood along. So we want to have valves to keep the uh, to keep the blood from going backwards, to keep it going forwards, okay? Pressure gradients. So we're looking at the pressure gradients here. You'll never, you'll never see that and have to memorize that. You just need to know the general trends. These are veins here, okay? These are pumping action of the muscles. So these veins are gathering together. We get blood up to here, okay? And then we got this valve closes so we don't get a, uh, any kind of fallback of the, uh, any kind of backwards motion of the blood. We have pressure gradients. We have the skeletal muscle pumps. We have the respiratory pump. So every time you breathe in and breathe out, you're actually moving blood through the vena cava up towards the heart. Smooth muscle contraction in veins with sympathetic stimulation. Nastomoses, we can have interconnections here, okay? We can have a straight through connection or we can have connections between, or straight through connection, this is arter arterial system, venous system, straight through connection, or we can have collateral Collateral circulations, okay, there's a number of those in the joint, in joints and brain, especially in the circle walls, which we won't learn specifically. We have a portal system, which includes two capillary beds, okay? So what happens is we have nutrients absorbed from the GI system, okay? Normally, then you go into the venous system, and go back up to the heart, but that's not in the, and then in, in from the heart, it would go out and it's got to, where it's wanting to go is to the liver, okay? But it wouldn't be a very efficient system because the heart sends blood all over the body. So let's take those nutrients, let's take those nutrients once we absorb them and, and we'll take them through the portal vein, the portal system, and we'll transport them to the liver. And so the liver will do whatever it's going to do with them, helping the manu helping the start of the process manufacturing, store some of them, uh, you know, detox things if it's medication uh, or break it down so it's medication is active. Okay. So that is a we've got a couple of those, or at least one of those systems that we're going to talk about. And that's one we're talking about now. That's a portal system. It takes the nutrients by way of the portal vein up to the liver. And then we, so we have the capillary bed in the GI system, the portal vein up to the liver, and then we're gonna have a capillary bed in the liver. So that's why it says we have two capillary beds and then we have, so it's up to the liver and then we have a hepatic vein, which is behind the liver, it's very short vein, hooks into the inferior vena cava, which will dump it into the system after that blood's been processed, okay? And so you need to know about that. You need to know that that, systems like that exist and why they why it exists okay blood flow blood pressure and resistance definition of terms blood flow volume of blood flow that flows through tissues at any given time okay 
So you will have a perfusion rate, how much flow, how much flow is going through the tissue. Cardiac output, we learned is the heart rate times the stroke volume, okay? We learned that stroke volume is usually 70 milliliters, and so whatever the heart rate is. Uh, how this becomes distributed is dependent on pressure differences. How pressure, you know, the more pressure, the harder it is to pump the flow and resistance, how much friction there is, okay? Friction can be from a number of things. It could be from a plaque. You know, somebody didn't eat very good diet. It has a lot of cholesterol plaque that's uh, deposited in the blood vessels, or it could be from the fact that the meta arterioles have contracted down because we don't want too much blood flow going through that capillary bed. So force per unit area exerted on the vessel wall. So blood pressure, pressure, the definition of pressure in the physics definition is force per unit area, okay? Uh, so when you measure the tire pressure, that's what you're measuring force per unit area. That's what. That's why if you take that, uh, if you took that volume of air and put it in a bigger tire, the pressure would be lower because the unit area would be big, would be larger. Okay, force per unit area uh, exerted on the blood vessel by the contained blood. Systolic pressure is the highest pressure. That's your ventricular contraction. Remember we talked about diastolic resting volume and systolic resting volume or systolic volume. Uh, so diastolic resting volume and systolic volume, yeah, the, uh, uh, the pressure, the blood that was in the heart uh, when the heart was at rest and the blood that was in the heart after, we got in diastolic, excuse me, it was called in diastolic volume and in systolic volume. The, the blood that was in the heart at the end of diastole, which uh, in the ventricle, in the end of diastole, which should be the maximum amount of blood in the ventricle and after, the in systolic volume was the blood that was in the heart after the heart had contracted. And we got those two volumes and so we subtracted and then we found out what the ejection fraction was. Diastolic pressure, lowest arterial pressure during diastole, that's the, that's the, they're both important, but that's the really the important one because that tells you what the pressure, what the pressure of the heart is at rest. Pulses and arteries, blood enters intermittently due to ventricular contraction. Expansion recoil of the arteries result. You uh, systolic pressure can be measured. You know, you put a blood pressure cuff on there. You can check your pulse in your temple and your neck and your groin. You can check your radial pulse. There's all kinds of places for you to check your own pulse. Normal is 120. At the lowest point between ventricular contractions, diastolic pressure can be measured, and the normal is 70 to 80. You'd like it to be less than 85. So. I, both my wife and I take uh, blood pressure medicine. So when the doctor looks at our blood pressure, uh, they want the diastolic to be less than 85. It used to be less than 90. Now they come down to less than 85. These values as a fraction, systolic pressure reflects the force of the left ventricle. Diastolic pressure reflects the condition of the, per of the peripheral vessels and the heart at rest. Pulse pressure, uh, these are just definitions, obviously, if you had a question on the test, which I don't think you do, but if you did, uh, then it would be systolic minus diastolic. That is pulse pressure, okay? Systolic minus diastolic, so systolic was 180, diastolic 120, and the diastolic was 80, your pulse pressure would be 40. Difference is what keeps blood flowing high to low. Taking pulse involves pushing on vessels enough to make this, to feel the systolic pressure against the walls. Pulse rate, average pulse rate, 75 beats per minute. Remember, the uh, SA node has a inherent pulse rate of 100 beats per minute, but because of the vagus, the parasympathetic interaction, it keeps that, it, it keeps the uh, pacemaker, the SA node's a pacemaker for the heart, keeps it around 70 to, eight beat, 70 to 80 beats per minute. It can be measured in various areas. You know, with, with, the uh, one we measure most in is the arm, okay? Mean arterial pressure is the average pressure in the arteries, okay? You and the way you measure that is, it takes into account the diastolic phase, which is longer than systolic, and it's the diastolic blood pressure plus one third of the difference between the sin systolic and diastolic. I actually, I don't think I ever use that uh, in my general surgery residency, but I could have, I just don't remember, obviously, something that I don't use, didn't use in plastic surgery. Uh, if you're critical care, you might use it 
uh, but it's not something I use. Or if you knew the cardiac output and resistance, you could do that. You could do it this way. Factors that increase blood pressure is increase in stroke volume, increase in blood volume, an increase in heart rate, increase in resistance. And so these are factors that increase the blood pressure. If you've got more volume, your blood pressure is going to go up. If you've got it more at the, each individual stroke okay, of the heart, stroke volume, the blood pressure is going to go up. Increase in the heart rate or increase in the resistance. Okay. Mean arterial blood pressure, cardiac resistance times resistance. And this is how we get cardiac output. Resistance, friction between the blood and the walls of the blood vessels. You'd ideally like it to be smooth. Okay. They're smooth with that single layer of squamous epithelium. Granted, when you have this branching off of these blood vessels, there is some turbulence there. There's no doubt about it. There is turbulence there. Blood viscosity. The more red blood cells you have, okay, or if you're dehydrated, okay, you're going to have increased increase resistance because of the number of red blood cells, okay. If you have anemia, it's just the opposite. Well, uh, total blood vessel length. Uh, well, one of those activities we did, uh, one of the activities you're going to do in chapter 19, it looks at blood vessel length, okay, and blood flow. And the other activity looks at radius of the blood vessel and blood flow. So those are the two activities you're going to do. Uh, if you're obese, you have a, an extra 650 kilometers of blood vessels for each kilogram of fat, because that is a significant number. Blood flow is fastest and highest pressure, large diameter vessels. Highest pressure, large diameter vessels, aorta, up the, you know, going up to the uh, Subclavian arteries, vertebral arteries. Uh, blood flow is slowest in low pressure, small diameter vessels. Uh, resistance varies inversely with the fourth power of the radius. Okay. And when you do that exercise about the radius, I believe it's this first activity, it's either one or three. You're going to change the radius and it'll tell you exactly what to change it to. It'll tell you to run the experiment and it'll, it'll measure the flow rate. Okay. So if you double the radius, you get 1 16th the resistance, okay? So as the vessel gets bigger, the resistance is less, so the flow rate increases, okay? Blood picks up speed in venules and veins as lowest pressure is compensated by the larger diameter. So that's how we get, that's another way that we get blood back. Even though it's very low pressure, we, the diameter of the veins and the inferior vena cava is bigger so the blood flow is going to increase, okay? So we're looking at resistance here. Resistance is very low here. And then as we get to the capillary beds, it's higher, okay? Then gets low again in the venous system. The velocity of blood flow is high in the arterial system, low in the capillaries. But remember, that's where we actually want it to be low, okay? Because that's where exchanges occurs. And then they're going to get higher as we go back into the venous system. Okay, maintaining blood pressure, act, uh, acts of change resistance. We have some neural control. We have barrel receptors. That's going to measure position. Okay, uh, whether you're laying down or standing up. Okay, higher than normal pressure stretches the barrel receptors, increasing signals to the cardiovascular system, increase peripheral nervous system, decrease sympathetic nervous system, decrease heart rate. Peripheral nervous system is the one that's going to decrease your heart rate and you decrease your blood pressure. Okay. So and you, it's the sympathetic nervous system. That's why when you get really nervous, your blood pressure goes up. I have white coat syndrome. When I go see a doctor, my blood pressure goes up, even though I was a doctor. Okay. Uh, and I always tell them, you know, when I go back to see the physician, I said, you know, I, I, I have white coat syndrome. And everybody knows what that is. Okay. Uh, and so they have me check my blood pressure at home, and sure enough, when I'm at home, uh, it's better. Or if they'll let me sit around a while, and they talk to me, then it gets lower too. And you may have that too. Some people have that. The sympathetic nervous system leading to arterial vasodilatation, decreased peripheral resistance. So you could, if you decrease the sympathetic nervous system by increasing the parasympathetic nervous system, you're going to have a decreased heart rate and decreased blood pressure, and it lowers the cardiac output. Or if the pressure is low, okay, it's going to do the exact opposite. You're going to have decreased peripheral uh, 
parasympathetic nervous system and increased sympathetic nervous system. The adrenal glands are going to release epinephrine and norepinephrine. The heart rate is going to increase. The strength of contraction is going to increase. You get higher cardiac output, increased activities of sympathetic nervous system, arterial vasoconstriction, and increased peripheral resistance. So you, what you want to do is increase the core blood pressure, okay? So you may clamp down in the peripheral areas, okay? And then on the central areas, like the uh, capillary beds in the GI system will be closed because you want to get that central blood pressure back up because the two things you've got to perfuse of the heart and the brain. Okay. This also makes you anxious as you're well aware. Okay. So a lot of performers, you know, I don't care how many years they've been performing, they will take a beta blocker. Okay. We learned a little bit about the beta blockers and that will decrease their heart rate. Well, if your heart rate's not going 120 or 140 beats in per minute, you're not as anxious, okay? And so they'll take beta blockers. They used to, uh, people, the golfers used to take beta blockers because you're standing over a putt, you know, that's gonna make your house payment or keep you on the tour. Yeah, uh, you know, it's a high pressure system and the people that, uh, snipers and people like that and people that shot guns in the Olympics used to take beta blockers to slow their pulse rate down. Sniper, one of the things they're trying to do is to slow their pulse rate down as low as possible, this is my understanding, obviously, I, I was not a uh, sniper, uh, so the pulse rate as low as possible so that the individual heartbeats do not interfere with their, uh, with their aim uh, and the trajectory. Chemo, so we have the baroreceptors. We also have chemoreceptors that sense low oxygen, low pH, high CO2, and they're going to cause increased sympathetic output because if you won't if you have decreased oxygen, okay, we need to speed up blood flow to the heart and to the lungs. We got hormonal control. We have angiotensin II, vasoconstrictor, needs angiotensin converted enzyme. ACE inhibitors lower pressure. I take an ACE inhibitor. That's one of the more common uh, blood pressure medicines that lowers the pressure of uh, blocking this. Okay, this is uh, 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 controversy, controversy because this is one of the uh, angiotensin II and the angiotensin converting enzyme is one of the ways, because this comes out of the lungs, that the uh, coronavirus is getting into the lungs. And so they're worried that if you take an ACE inhibitor, uh, that that's preventing, that is preventing the mechanism that's going to keep the coronavirus out of the lungs. I, I haven't read very much about it, but I know that that's one of the things they're looking at ACE inhibitors and uh, the coronavirus. And, it, you know, I don't know a whole lot. You know, obviously, I know about coronavirus, but I don't know. I know that's one of the mechanisms, okay? We have antidiuretic hormone, which we'll look at in detail when we talk about the kidneys, okay? It retains water, vasoconstriction. Because you have low blood pressure, you want to retain volume, okay? We have epinephrine and norepinephrine, vasoconstriction. However, they do cause vasodilatation in the heart and skeletal muscle. Okay, nicotine will cause vasoconstriction, uh, directly stimulating sympathetic neurons and promoting release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So you're going to get uh, increased pressure here. We have atrial natriuretic, uh, atrial natriuretic factor that's released by the heart. That is in that's a sense of it senses the stretch in the atria. Okay, and so when the pressure gets too high. The pressure gets too high. This ANF, atrial natriuretic factor, and, uh, blocks aldosterone, okay? Blocks aldosterone. And so what aldosterone does, and we'll, we'll go into this in great detail when we get into the kidney. It, aldosterone causes, secret, uh, uh, causes the re retention of sodium. And if you retain sodium, Sodium is an ion, so it's hydrated, which means it has water molecules around it. So every sodium ion you bring in has it surrounded by water molecules. So you're going to increase your volume. Well, if the atria is stretched too much because of volume or pressure, then it's going to antagonize the aldosterone. It's going to cause the aldosterone not to work as effectively as it would work. So we're going to excrete sodium into the urine instead of keeping instead of keeping it back. Okay, 
we're going to excrete it. And so when we excrete it, we excrete water with it, okay? And when that happens, then the volume goes down, the pressure will go down. So that's what this particular hormone does, okay? Long-term mechanisms, alter blood volume, renal regulation, renin-angiotensin mechanism, angiotensin above, ADH to reabsorb water, aldosterone to absorb sodium, activate the thirst mechanism. So if we need to increase our volume, these are things we can do. Direct kidneys secrete more of less water. Direct kidneys secrete more or less water if necessary without hormone fluids by increasing or decreasing the speed of filtration. There again, it's mentioning these because we're talking about the blood vessels. This is what interacts, but we'll go into, I can assure you, much greater detail. And so this is not, this is the part that's not really emphasized very much on. Um, 17, 18, 19 on the test because it's going to be tested when we talk about the kidneys because we actually have two chapters on the kid. Uh, we have a chapter on kidneys and a chapter on acid base regulation. So we cover that in great detail. So don't worry. This we're, we're, get, we're taking a big overview right now. This is just a big overview. Okay. So don't worry. It seems like we're flying through this. Just a big overview. Say, say we got barrel receptors. We got chemo receptors. We got hormonal control, okay? We got, uh, okay? And so that's our big control. And then we actually got local control at the kidneys, okay? So we can actually have local control at the kidneys. We have auto regulation depending on tissue needs, metabolic control, declining O2, or, or increasing West causes vasodilatation. So if we don't have enough O2, our increasing waste products in cells, we're gonna get vasodilatation. Can also be indirect release of nitrous oxide. Okay, it's going to give us vasodilatation. If you're a fitness person, you know, if you read the fitness magazines, one of the things they want you to buy is this nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide to uh, cause the increased vasodilatation of the uh, vessels in the muscles. Actually, it causes all the vessels in the muscles. And this is actually the mechanism that the Erectile uh, 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 dysfunction medications work. They uh, specifically cause uh, uh, vasodilatation, okay? And so by releasing nitrous oxide, opening, closing precapillary sphincters. So the nitrous oxide is important. The body actually has natural occurring nitrous oxide. I don't know how much that muscle stuff works, uh, you know, that you buy to do the blood. But, if it's like all the other stuff, it probably doesn't work very much, but there again, I don't know. And so we have metabolic control. These are some of our metabolic controls. And we open and close the free capillary sphincters. We have myogenic response. Passive stretch, passive, passive stretching causes increased contraction to slow blood flow. So increased pressure causes the vessels to stretch, increased contraction, to, and so we're going to get increased contraction to slow the blood flow. Reduced stretch promotes vasodilatation to increase blood flow into the tissue. So now we're talking about the level of capillary bed to the at the tissue bed. So we're talking about the very basic levels here, trying to main, maintain blood flow. We can we can grow new blood vessels, okay, and that's called angiogenesis. We have skeletal muscle exercise, one of the most strenuous situations, cardiovascular system, auto regulatory stimulus, CO2 builds up, O2 decreases. We have brain, most metabolic active organ, requires constant blood flow. Auto regulatory stimulus, very little, but brain assists to changing CO2, causes vasodilatation. Lungs, auto regulatory, low pressure, exactly the opposite. Low CO2 in the area of the lungs. Now, this, you'll need to know this. If you've got low O2, okay, we're going to have vasoconstriction of that area. Okay, so the capillary beds in that area that has the low O2 is going to have vasoconstriction because if you've got very little O2 in there, you're not going to, because the O2 is exchanged because of a gradient, okay, because of a gradient when we get to the respiratory system, which will be the third chapter in the second block. And then the next exam, we do a chapter on lymphatics, a chapter on immune system, and then the respiratory system. That there's a gradient that causes, you know, O2 moves by diffusion because O2 in the lungs is in higher concentration than it is in the capillary bed, so it goes outside. Well, if you have a low O2, 
there's no sense of that capillary bed being available, okay, being available in the lungs, okay, because we're not going to have any O2 exchange occurred because the concentration of O2 is so low, okay. Whereas if you have a high O2 level, the dilates the vessels, okay. Same way with blood flow, same way with blood flow. If we have low blood flow in a particular segment, or say that segment is plugged with mucus or pneumonia, where there's not a, there's not a whole lot. If it's plugged, you're not going to get any oxygen going down in there because that uh, respiratory alveolus, the, the conducting alveolus are, are, are plugged, okay? So you're going to have, so this is a perfect example. If, uh, if you've got a plug in there and mucus in there, you're not going to have dilation of the capillary beds because no exchange is going to occur. You're going to have aneurysms, okay? If you get continuous high blood pressure, there are certain areas that have weakened areas and they can form aneurysms. This is the type of aneurysm. The worst case scenario is they can rupture, okay? You can get varicose veins because the valves are incompetent and allow blood to go backflow. So the pressure builds up, it dilates up the veins, prolonged standing, pregnancy, and hereditary, heredity. Okay, you can have orthostatic hypotension, decrease in blood pressure when one stands up, resulting in dizziness and syncope, or due to sluggish barrel reflexes. You can have atherosclerosis, which has hardening in the arteries, so they become less elastic, and both pressure, systolic and diastolic pressure arise. So you can get some, somebody that's very old, okay, and their normal blood pressure will be higher than a normal blood pressure should be, but it's because of their hardening of their arteries. Their, art, their arteries don't have that much recoil, okay? So you don't want to bring their blood pressure down too much towards normal, okay? Obviously, it's way too high, you gotta bring it down. But you, do, you know, what normal for you would be different than what's normal for a 90 year old, okay? Capillary dynamics, capillary exchange, simple diffusion, through fenestrations, through, uh, O2, CO2, glucose, amino acids, and hormones, all plasma solutes. So these are things that go by simple diffusion. Proteins, the only capillaries that pass are the endothelial cells and the liver sinusoids. So that, you know, we absorb the proteins from the GI system, and then we take them up to the liver, and they're going to go through the liver sinusoids. Remember, those sinusoids are just big, vascular spaces. They're not really... I mean, they're a contained space, but they're not per se a blood vessel, okay? Brain junctions, non-fenestrated. We have a blood-brain barrier. So that's why I told you if you are taking care of somebody and they have, a, and they have an, uh, a meningitis, okay, or encephalitis, and you need to get the antibiotic into the central nervous system, you need to find out if it crosses the blood-brain barrier. Filtration, reabsorption, bulk fluid moves across membrane along with nutrients and gases. Forced out of clefts at the arterial end. So now we're talking about this pressure head. We got a pressure head. We got gaps in the arterial end. Okay. Return the blood at the venous end. Direction amount of fluid that moves is dependent on two types of forces. So now we're going to talk about that capillary exchange. Okay. Star this. Okay. This is probably a 10, maybe a 15 point. Uh, short discussion question, okay? This is a short discussion question on your exam. So star this, listen to this, go over this. We have the net filtration pressure, which is the pressure at the arterial end, which is pushing, okay? Net filtration pressure, which is pushing. We have the net absorption pressure, okay? Which is, dominates at the venous end, which is our colloidal osmotic pressure, which is pulling, okay? Remember at the venous end, all those, the big, the, uh, the proteins, the big molecules, the cells, they all stayed inside because they couldn't go out through these clefts. These clefts were just too small for those things. So they are trying to pull fluid back in, okay? Hydrostatic pressure, force exerted against the vessel wall due to the blood pressure. So. Hydrostatic pressure, we have hydrostatic pressure inside the vessel, and we have hydrostatic pressure in the interstitial fluid. Hydrostatic pressure in the capillary is higher at the arterial end than venous end as pressure drops to the capillary. Hydrostatic pressure interstitial fluid opposes movement of the fluid 
out of vocabulary. You don't have to use these uh, abbreviations. I, I don't know if I ever saw them before for these slides, okay? So we have hydrostatic pressure in the capillary that's trying to push the fluid out through the clefts, okay? Starting at the arterial end. And all the fluid that can push out, it will, okay? We have hydrostatic pressure of the interstitial fluid that, that is pressure on the outside that opposes that movement. And I gave you the example, this is just an example. We have hydrostatic pressure inside the capillary of 20 millimeters of mercury. We have hydrostatic pressure outside the capillary in this initial fluid of five. We got 20 pushing out, five pushing in. So the net pressure just based on the hydrostatic pressure would be 15 millimeters of mercury. So in this particular thing, hydrostatic pressure inside the capillary is about 35 millimeters of mercury at the arterial end. Okay, so 35 millimeters. So this is the cap. This is the capillary. This is the arterial end. Got 35 millimeters pushing out. Hydrostatic pressure capillary at the venous end is about 17 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so we still have hydrostatic pressure at the venous end, but it has dropped some 18 millimeters of mercury. Hydrostatic pressure at the interstitial fluid, even though we made this big thing about talking about it. It, in this particular example, is zero at both ends, okay? So the force pushing fluid back in at the arterial end and at the venous end is zero, okay? So we have zero at the arterial end and zero at the venous end, okay? So we have hydrostatic pressure of the capillary at the arterial end, 35 millimeters of mercury, at the venous end, 17 millimeters of mercury. Hydrostatic pressure of the interstitial fluid is Zero at both ends. I don't know if this example already takes takes account of, uh, of subtracting it, but this is the way the example is set up. Net filtration pressure, arterial hydrostatic pressure is 35 out, zero in, 35 out. At the venous end, it's 17 out, zero in, 17 out. So far, all the fluid is going out at both ends. Okay, but what's keeping some of the fluid back in? is the colloidal osmotic pressure of the material that is too big to be filtered out, to be pressured out of those clefts. Concentration of large non-diffusible molecules, primarily proteins, but also cells, okay? These molecules draw fluid around them because they are ions also, they, you know, and uh, because the interstitial fluid, the intervascular fluid, Extracellular fluid, intercellular fluid is primarily made, uh, uh, made up of water. These particular things are hydrated, right? which means they have water surrounding them. Okay. Osmotic pressure of the capillary is 26 at both ends. Okay. So that's 26. Now they draw the arrow here, pushing inwards. It's actually, it would be there, if you think about it, it's pulling it in, but it's pushing it. So we have 26 at both ends, okay? So we have 26 at both ends. Osmotic pressure, interstitial fluid is one out at both ends. So we have one out at both ends because of the particles outside in the interstitial fluid are pulling fluid out. These particles inside the intervascular space are pulling fluid in. So one out, 26 in, that'd be 25 in, 35 out, okay? Net absorption pressure, 35 out, 35 out. We have 26 in, one out, so that's 25. So we have 25 in, so a net of 10 out. 35 out, 26 in by colloidal osmotic pressure, intervascular space, one out by colloidal osmotic pressure, Florida osmotic pressure of the interstitial fluid for a net filtration pressure. We had 35 out, we had 26 in, one out. That means 25 in net, net arterial pressure. Net arterial pressure there is 10 out, okay? And net arterial pressure is eight in, okay? Because we had 17 going out here. We have 26 going in by the, remember all those, all those uh, cells, proteins and everything like that are still in here. They've gone from the arterial end to the venous end, okay? 17 out, 20, 26 in, one out, so 25 in. And arterial pressure is eight in. 
for a total for a total filtration pressure of two out. Total filtration pressure of two out. So here's the setup for your question. If you divide, if you decrease the colloidal osmotic pressure by half inside the intervascular, intervascular space. So in other words, instead of being 26, it's 13. So this would be in somebody who doesn't eat well and has hypoproteinemia, okay? Has low uh, protein, okay? Low albumin, okay? Has low albumin because they don't eat good or they have some kind of disease. What's going to be your net pressure, okay? And that's your discussion question, okay? But you need to be able to understand this and you have to go through the whole mechanism here. You have to go through the whole mechanism here. This is why it's a big ticket discussion item. This allows you to understand why there's actually filtration going out of the capillary bed, okay? And so we ended up with a net of two out. Well, that means we have two millimeters of mercury, we have pressure, so we have a net of uh, filtration of two out. Well, what happens to that two out? It doesn't just stay there, because if it stayed there, your, every, your entire body would swell up. And we'll learn next week in chapter 20 that the lymphatics pick this up. Okay, the lymphatics pick this up. But you need to understand this, okay? You need to understand this. And so it is laid out here for you. You need to go through it two or three times uh, to be able to understand it. But imagine you've had a question that says the chloral osmotic pressure inside the blood vessel, inside the blood vessel, was half of what it normally is. Well, you can see it's 26 normally. Okay, and if it's half of what it is, only the one inside the blood vessel, one outside the blood vessel, the blood vessel is already one. Okay, what would happen here? So that you need to come come to grips with that because you're going to see that question later on. Okay, and so this just goes to that whole scenario again. In result, about 85% of the filter fluid would be reabsorbed. Okay, the lymphatic system picks up the rest. Homostatic imbalance, we get edema. Okay, here's edema here. Increased capillary function, accumulation of excess is fluid. In, uh, increased blood pressure, poor venous return. This is just examples of that. In, reduced capillary absorption, decreased blood albumin, liver disease, kidney disease, okay? So you can imagine, you can imagine that if you, if you had less Albumin, which are, we're talking about the protein. Albumin is the protein, okay? That makes up, that's, it's not the only one, but it makes up, makes up a major component. If we had less of that, then we're going to get a whole lot more fluid out, okay? And that's going to result in edema. Obstructed lymphatic drainage interferes with interstitial drainage. Or you can have the, uh, in the old days, when I was a general surgeon resident, we had breast cancer. We did a modified radical mastectomy which means we took the breast tissue, saved the pectoralis major muscle, because before me, the generations before me, they did a radical mastectomy, which means they took the pectoralis major muscle and the breast tissue and the skin overlying the chest. And we, we did an axillary dissection. Well, if you do an axillary dissection, you're taking out lymph nodes. Well, if you're taking out lymph nodes, those lymph nodes are in the channels of those lymphatic ducts. So you're, uh, you are taking out those channels. And one of the problems that the ladies got afterwards, and it might not be a lady, say you had a melanoma, you were a man or a woman, and you were doing an axillary dissection because you had positive lymph nodes or you were looking for positive lymph nodes. Same thing could happen. You could get edema of that arm because you had not the, the it wasn't obstructed. It was no longer there. Or you can get infections of the, uh, 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 lymphatic system, which will cause obstruction. And that's the end. Okay, so the, the big ticket things here are to know about the blood vessels, know how the pressure drops as it goes through the blood vessels, know about the basic structure of the blood vessels, know that, the, note, note about elastic muscular routing, uh, you know, the routing blood vessels, the blood vessels, the meta arterioles, how they function in the capillary beds, Note that the cap that exchange occurs at the capillary beds. 
We're just talking about fluid here when we talk about that last part, filtration, okay? But exchange of oxygen, CO2, nutrients, small molecules occurs by diffusion because they're all in greater concentration in the blood vessels than they are outside the, out in the interstitial fluid uh, because the cells, have, you know, cell undergoes cellular respiration and develop and uh, other things and develops waste products. So they need to be exchanged, okay? I had a bunch of announcements at the first uh, uh, that uh, week four, uh, the, the thing was up. That's your, essentially your roadmap is what you have, what, 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 what's going to occur uh, when, when things are due, when they be, need to be in. We discussed about the, uh, the penalty for late uh, turn in of assignments again, 2% a day, up to 10 days, it reaches a maximum of 20%. So if you did it perfectly and would normally get 15 points uh, and you turn it in uh, 11 days late, you would get a deduction of three points. You don't get 12 points. That doesn't amount to much over, over one, but if you're gonna do them all late and the uh, lab is 300 points, then you have lost 60 points. And so you've lost, you're down to 240 there. And if you do your Pearson, uh, and you do uh, all of those late, then you're down to 160 there. And so already you've lost 100 points and you've lost, and you've lost your aid, okay? So yeah, that it, it's a built-in thing. So if you got to turn in late, you're not going to, you know, because, you know, the consequences for a day or two late is like 0 0.2, 0 0.4, something like that, in what, it, what it's worth. So it's not a big deal. But if you're going to do every one of your assignments consistently late, because the whole purpose is to do the assignments, to help you to understand the material. Because this material is way, way, way more difficult than the material was in anatomy and physiology. One, anatomy and physiology one was primarily just names with a little bit of physiology, but not very much. You know, we had the muscle, we had muscle conduction and nerve conduction. Okay, those were the big physiology to take it out. But you can already see all the hormones we talked about that work in the kidneys, okay? You can already see the hormones we talked about working in the kidneys and the things that are going to occur with how oxygen and CO2 is transported in the respiratory system. There's going to be a lot of physiology here. And so the purpose of the assignments is to help you learn the material, if you learn the material. And so uh, that's all uh, of the lecture. Anybody got any questions? All right, I will try to get this up by the lecture up by the night or tomorrow. You already have a lecture from another semester. And we went through the filtration thing in that lecture in great detail. Uh, oh, the, the one other thing, make sure, make sure you're here at, at one o'clock next week on the 8th, because we're going to have a review of chapters 17, 18, and 19. And I guarantee you part of the review will be the going through the same thing we talked about or about our net filtration pressure and that example, okay? I had a, a quick question. Okay, go ahead. Um, I wrote it in the chat, but I was wondering if there's any videos on YouTube to understand this chapter just a little bit uh, clearer. Yeah, just... there there is. Uh, you, you saw the videos I put up on chapter uh, 17. Yeah. Yeah, that guy usually does videos too. All you have to do, is go to uh, YouTube and type in Marib chapter 19, okay? Okay. So that's what, uh, that's all you have to do for any of the chapters, okay? Just type in Marib chapter 19 or chapter 20, chapter whatever chapter you want to do, and they'll just pop up. Some of them are good, some of them are really good, and some of them are not so good, okay? okay uh, but gotcha. the, the, the per the person that did chapter 17, he didn't do, he did all the, of the uh, uh, first semester video, or all of the, the chapters in one through 16, and he did 17. I don't know if he did the rest of them or not. I can look and I can put, uh, uh, oh, I just have slides. I just have slides. But, uh, but they do, they do, they do, they did the videos, okay, they did the videos, and there are a lot of good videos there, 
know, because A, A and P anatomy is taught at the, uh, you know, you have AP, uh, human anatomy and physiology taught at the high school level. And at the college level, and there's a lot of good instructors. They may be high school instructors, but they're still good and they explain the stuff really well. Okay, so just put Marib, which is the author of our book, and put chapter 17, or you can put Marib, Anatomy and Physiology, chapter 19, okay? And they'll just come popping up. There'll be a whole bunch of them. Any chapter you want to look at. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. I'll see you next week, as always. As always, uh, if you need to contact me, contact me by email, okay? And uh, uh, use the Outlook email because I get it right away on my app. Thank you.